Well, here we are again to speak to another one of the incredible presenters that I have pulled together for us to start this very important conversation on how we as health professionals can future-proof ourselves. So I started these discussions yesterday with the fabulous Jane McNaught, another Australian, somebody who I have known over the last couple of years and who I have come to really respect and appreciate the way she takes herself into the world. And this morning, I have the pleasure of speaking with Teresa Tran. Now, Teresa, where, whoops, I just saw that thing popping up. Where is she? I'm going to bring her on because, you know, we have worked all out all of the little bumps and things from yesterday. Uh, why won't it let me just do that? Anywho. All right. She will be here in a second. It is going to be turning up. I see that Jill Johnson Young has arrived here today. That is really cool. And that's just why I like to turn up a couple of minutes early to make sure that I can get the people into the space in the right time. And I worked out which button I needed to press. Go me, the queen of not all the things technology, um, which is really, really cool because Jill Johnson Young, who is also a part of this symposium, when I met Jill a few years ago, five, six, seven, one of the first things Jill said to me was, don't ask me to do technology. I don't do tech. She is now one of the most tech-savvy people I have ever known, and um, she just delights me every time I get the opportunity to work with her because, you know, she's, she's learned how to do it. Now, Teresa is on her way in. Facebook gives me a little notification that says adding, adding, adding adding. So I am, I am thrilled to know that we've made that happen without needing um, extra time for Joe to learn how to make Facebook behave itself on a, what day of the week is it today? I think it's a Tuesday. So some of you in the USA and the Northern Hemisphere are celebrating a holiday today. So enjoy your holiday. If you're catching the replay of this live chat, make sure you hit hashtag replay, put it in the comments below. If you've got any questions about anything that Teresa's gonna be talking about today, uh, anything that uh, about the symposium that we've got coming up in a couple of weeks time, please let me know. You just put the questions below, that way we can answer them. We'll always come back and answer your questions. Now, it may be interesting for you to know that Teresa and I are both in Sydney, Australia. She's in one part of Sydney. I'm in another part of Sydney. And sometimes we have absolutely horrific internet here in this country. So we are now struggling, not with Facebook, but with, <laughs> with getting the internet to actually function for us. So that's um, unhelpful as well. So let me hear this button again. Let's do that again. And we will ask Teresa. Oh, I think it's happening. Yay! Woo! Morning, we made it into Joe. the house. How are you? you? Okay. <laughs> I can. I can just hear you okay. I'm just going to turn my volume up and I'm going to ask you too. to. Yeah, let's All do right. that. That's that very good. <laughs> So you are very faint. So I don't know if you can move the microphone close. Nope, it's all good. That's okay. Hey, Debbie, lovely to have you here with us. Um, this is gonna, this is gonna be great. So Teresa, quite a few of the people in my world won't actually know you, um, and I've had the privilege of knowing of you and around you for quite a long period of time. We've been doing very similar work now for for a while. But the we most important been. thing I want to start with is you're an occupational therapist. Is that correct? I, I am an occupational therapist. And whenever I say I'm an occupational therapist, I'll say, what is an OT? Can you hear me? Okay? Yes. Hang on. This set, your sound is so, so faint. Can we play with your sound a little bit? Can uh, anyone, yeah. Is anyone else having trouble hearing um, Teresa or is it just me? If someone could let us know, Teresa can just start explaining what an occupational therapist is, what you do. What do you do? Okay, well, hopefully everyone can hear me. I do not know why we're having tech issues today of all days. But um, look, an occupational therapist is uh, a person or a therapist 
who helps people to build their independence. So we focus a lot on um, activities of daily living to ensure that people can do their everyday things. We focus on work and we also uh, focus on com um, community engagement as well. Excellent. So when you say you focus on independence, so all the mental health professionals and the physical therapists and the EPs in my world and the rehab counsellors, don't forget us, they're going to say, we do exactly the same thing. What that's do you right. do that's different? We are very good at breaking down tasks, Joe. So that's what OTs do really well. So we, we look at a task and we say to ourselves, what does this person need to do to be able to get from point A to point B? And then we look, we look at that and then we break it down. And what we do is we guide people along that way, step by step, build up their uh, confidence um, and, and through that, hopefully build up their independence as well. So we're very good at prompting, um, providing pers you know, verbal cues, uh, physical cues. And yeah, we basically guide people along depending on what the, what the level of need is. So our programs are really um, flexible in that way. Yeah, I, I love OTs. A lot of people mistake me for being an OT, which I'm actually quite honoured. Uh, <laughs> I had incredible mentoring when I started my career from, from an occupational therapist. And, and I think very much in terms of function. How do we get this person from where they are and where they want to be and what are the steps involved? And then the, the added bonus of how do we hack their smarts because they're telling themselves they can't do that. Absolutely, Jo. And the, the, the greatest thing about OT, and this is why I got into OT, is that it's not boxed. We're not boxed into, you know, like a, um, into something that's really specific. So when we're talking about people's goals, it could be anything. It could be, I want to return to work. Um, I want to be able to eat my soup again you know yeah. um because i've had a stroke and uh, you know and this is what i what i really want to get back to um you know i want to be able to play with my child so it's so broad in uh what a person's goal is but the beauty of it is is it's that individual's goal and that's what we're yeah. working on and when they achieve it it's absolute magic it, it is magic so apart from being an OT, you've also got a master's degree in occupational health and safety or work <laughs> health and safety. <laughs> I do. What made so you decide to go and do a master's in that? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I actually um, studied OT, worked for a couple of years in op rehab. Um, and funnily, funnily enough, Jo, I actually thought I would be a paediatric OT when I finished. Huh studies and everything that I did actually focused on working with kids and then when I finished and applied for a job there were no jobs in peds at that time so I ended up falling into op rehab and I absolutely love it and I feel like it, it must have been divine intervention for that to happen so mm. uh, when I uh, worked in op rehab I worked a lot with obviously people who had had injuries at work um, and our goal was to help them to return to work. And, but through that, what I realized was that I wanted to be on the front end. And a lot of people who came to me and talked to me said, you know, Teresa, I wish I could turn back time. Um, if I could, mm. this injury would never happen. It would have never affected my life the way it has. So that's what actually spurred me on to do uh, my master's in OH, well, work health safety was OHS back then. Um, and it was to look at that prevention piece, to look at, well, how do we stop these injuries from happening so that people's lives aren't impacted this way? Wow. Well, thank you for taking on that huge task. So you actually have a business here in Sydney. Please tell us about Skilled Health because that name is very cool. Oh, oh, I'm glad you like that name, Joe. I do like it too, but I'm just, I'm not being biased or anything. Um, so today I'm actually in our Liverpool office, which is our head office. We've also got a Parramatta office as well. Um, and Skilled Health looks at basically empowering individuals. So we've been talking about that this morning. We do a bit of work in the op rehab space, so um, helping injured workers to return to work. But we also do a lot of work in the NDIS space as well, so helping participants to return to um, whatever goal they have for their lives. So whether it be um, returning back to work for some in a vocational sense um, or looking at returning back into the community um, after a period of time out of it, whether it be because of barriers around, say, mental health um, that stop them from actually leaving their homes, for example. Um, or, you know, we, we do, do a bit of work with um, kids, but, you know, for us, 
it is about empowering people and that's what the NDIS, well, the National Disability Insurance Scheme here in Australia is all about. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. People are badly Googling NDIS. What is this what NDIS? Is NDIS? <laughs> yes, that's right. Right. That's, right. that, that's, that's all okay. So it's, it's really cool for me to hear that um, you've been able to take your occupational therapy skills and your work health and safety skills and you've built a team on multiple sites. And most recently, you, you've started educating people studying occupational therapy. Is that correct? That's right. So recently I started, well, I've, I've been involved in universities before with students, um, educating them around off rehab. But recently I, I took on some lecturing work at the University of Sydney and I'm absolutely loving it. Um, just getting in there with the students and actually showing them what is it like in the real world to work as an occupational therapist in rehabilitation. Um, so it's been a real eye-opener, but if anything, it's so dear to my heart because I just remember what I was like as a student back then as well. Like, you know, a fresh, a fresh student, uh, wide-eyed and just, you know, wanting to get out there in the world and make a difference, but not quite sure how I was going to do it. So that's, that's, that's something that I really want to work towards to help others. Yeah, ab absolutely. I remember that day. I remember the time when somebody said, you are now licensed. You're allowed to go out there. We're going to leave you alone and you can go see clients. And I went, wait, what? What are we doing yeah. now? What? How? What? What does that mean? <laughs> How do I do that? Hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Is that written somewhere in my, in my textbook? No, it's not. No, it's not. And that's why we're, we're here, Joe, to, to, you know, to talk about this in the symposium. Like, how do we... How do we make sure that we're future-proofing things for our, our future? Because this future generation is going to carry on, you know, our profession. Yeah. And, and let's face it, when we graduate, well, I don't know about you, I graduated in 1996. When did you graduate? I graduated in 1999. So we are all uh -huh. so, we've, we've talked about this a little bit. When we were graduating and the types of people and the issues that were turning up in front of us, are very, very different to the types of people and issues that are turning up today. Yet Absolutely. our university training isn't being adjusted to, to deal with that change. Um, that, no, and that, that's yeah. a part of my concern around future-proofing the generations to come is that we're actually not teaching them what they need to know. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think that teaching at university is more than just, you know, the textbook stuff. Like that is fantastic. And I think that we need to be passing on that technical knowledge. So it's great that you walk away with that. But what else should we be looking at? We really should be looking at um, harnessing each individual like, and, and realising what is it that we as individuals bring to this role. You know, I always say to new students, you could get 10 OTs lined up with one problem and the 10 OTs will give you different ways or different strategies to answer the problem or work out you know overcome that barrier um and why is that it's because we all have different we're all from different walks of life we all have different experiences and we bring that into our practice makes it, it we, it's the same but different you know <laughs> so that's a great segue into a question i have for you what what made you even decide ot was something you wanted to do did you just wake up one day and went, oh, I picked that out of the, out of the book. You remember that book that we had? <laughs> the UAC book where you just had to write yeah. down your I picked that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let me just tell you that I had accounting on there and I'm glad that I did not go into accounting because I'm not <laughs> great with numbers. And I don't know why, but I put that down. Um, look, for me, Jo, it's, it's actually quite personal. My, my mom actually was diagnosed with rheumatoid, severe rheumatoid arthritis in her 30s. And for years, she didn't know what she had. We went to well, yeah. see a lot of specialists. She had a lot of tests done. Um, and when she was pregnant with my brother, which is the fifth baby in the family, it was when she was actually diagnosed with um, severe rheumatoid arthritis. And at the time, they thought that my brother would actually be born with a severe disability because of all the medications that she was mm. on. So um, I guess life just meant that I was a young carer at a young age for my mum. And it really was an eye-opener um, going with her to see different um, treatment providers um, and supporting her because she was from a non-English speaking background. So I was her interpreter as well. So uh, for me, it really kind of um, made me realise that 
there are, if my mum is in this situation, there would be so many other people who would be in exactly the same situation who would not know how to access the right treatment. Um, and so for me, it really drove me to want to make a change. So I thought, well, and I met some great OTs who worked with my mum as well. And I thought to myself, I think this is my calling. And I say it to my husband every day. I think I've always, I have always meant to be an OT. I feel like I'm in, I'm in the right job. Wow. I, I feel like you are. And I know that Kenneth is, is watching, so I'm pretty sure he is really proud <laughs> of you today. And I see Kelly has put up that she thinks that you are hands down the best connector and mentor on the planet. So I think Aww, that's pretty thank outstanding. You. Thank you, Kelly, for that feedback. Thank you, Kelly. And I just want to thank Kelly too, because she actually reconnected us. Um, so it, that was really special she for did. us to have that happen as well. A little protege. <laughs> We brought Absolutely. this back together. That's really, really <laughs> cool. So um, I, before I ask you the really big question, I've got a couple of other questions to get to know you, if that's okay with you. Sure, um, sure. What was your first paid job? My first, first paid job was working in a cafe. My parents are very typical Asian parents, and they did not let me work at all during my studies, like my years of studies at school. And I begged to go to work. And then when I finally finished and got into uni, they said, okay, that's, that's fine. You can go to work now if you want. So I got this job in a cafe. I had absolutely no experience whatsoever. Um, and I wasn't great at it. Let me just tell you, I just don't think that I'm good for hospitality. So <laughs> uh, for someone who doesn't drink coffee, I was terrible at making coffees and teas. I, don't, I, I apologize now for anyone who had a coffee or a tea that was made by me. But yeah, I just... Um, I enjoyed it in that it was it was wonderful to work with different people, uh, but I did not enjoy the work at all. <laughs> I, I, I understand that one of one of my first jobs was I was a waitress for a, a large chain restaurant, and I I hated it. I would stand in the middle of this restaurant and go, "How the hell am I supposed to do all of this?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't fun for me. So this is obviously why we are health professionals because hospitality was not our calling. <laughs> oh, definitely not. And I take my hat off to those who make, you know, who can do that because honestly, it's harder than it looks, people. <laughs> <laughs> most definitely. So, Teresa, tell us, who is the most famous person you have ever met? Okay. Would you, I could just tell you, but that wouldn't be any fun. So, I have, I'm going to do a little skit. Okay, like I'm really good at acting, not really. Um, but you're gonna have to guess. I'm, I'm gonna give you a clue. All right, so here I, I've got I like I've got a little. This is a jewelry box. Okay, so just a, and um, all right. So I'm gonna get into scene. So here I am. I am a very rich and um, good-looking gentleman. Okay, and I am holding up this jewelry box. And because I'm here by myself, I now have to play two roles. Okay, so that's. That was role number one. And now here I am. And I am now a gorgeous um, uh, young lady who was living on the streets and has scrubbed up really well. And I'm looking at the jewelry box. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone guess that? Oh, end scene. <laughs> wow. Well, I am going to, I'm just going to sit here and go all like, oh my God, she met someone really famous. And I want everyone to put who they think it is in the chat below. And then Teresa can um, have some fun responding to you around that. That is really cool. <laughs> So, Teresa, I've asked you to come and speak uh, at the symposium, the um, Future of the Health Professional Symposium, so that we can actually start progressing this conversation around how do we need to future-proof ourselves? What are the things that we need to be looking out for? So, from somebody who has been in work, helping people make their work work, and now training other people and also having your own story about that, what do you see as one of the most important things that we need to be focused on? Okay, so Joe, I mean, I named my little topic um, finding the lid that fi uh, finding the lid that fits the pot. Now, the the reason I I called it that, and oh, sorry, and then the second part is 
um, how knowing yourself can save time and energy to bring business to the boil. And the reason I called it finding the lid that fits the pot is because my mum used to say that about me finding a husband, actually. So it was about finding the perfect person. And I think that that kind of relates to business as well. So in business, we need to find the right customers that work for us. Um, we need to feel that we uh, have the same, uh, I guess, uh, a, you know, a good vibe going, but also having, you know, uh, the right values uh, as well, you know. So for me, it is about uh, talking about the future and teaching people how to go about working to build their business and build themselves as individuals and therapists as well to know, well, when do I take this? When do I not take this? And, um, you know, and just feel like you can build a good relationship by not just taking every job that there, you know, that comes, comes to you. Yeah. Very, it's such an important thing. And I think we get so caught up in what, what I call the martyrdom, which is I've got to help all the people. I've got to help all the people. And we, and I know for myself and probably many people that are watching this, we do that at a cost to ourselves. And, and a really, really big part of our self care is learning what we need to say no to. And then another big part of that is learning how to say no in a way that fits with us so that we don't feel, you know, revolting afterwards. Because most of us aren't real good at saying no. Would that be correct? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And you know what, Joe? over the years, I mean, I've been OT now for 22 years. And I'm going to say I've had many trips and falls along the way in that time. And a lot of, and not, I would always say a lot, but some of the times where we have not done well is because we've gone against what our gut is telling us about a job. We think that we can do it all, but we actually can't. So we shouldn't really be stretching outside, you know, um, our parameters. Um, and I think that's a mistake that a lot of people will, will make along the way as well. Um, and, yeah. you know, you get past it and it all ends well, but you think looking back later, wow, I worked really hard. I much I worked a lot harder than I should have to get that done, you know. And and it's about being smarter about those choices. Fantastic. So I'm really really looking forward to extending this interview in our symposium, which is starting on the 18th 19th of September. Depending on where you are in the world, I'm going to be furthering this interview with Teresa, and she's going to be sharing with us some of those things that she did that she kind of went. Mm -hmm this wasn't the best thing I could have done so that we can learn from her experience and we can start to take notice of where we're saying yes when it's possibly not the best response or where we're saying no and it's possibly not the best response so Teresa thank you so much if people wanted to get in touch with you before the symposium starts how how can they do that what's the best way for them to do that well you can definitely email me at Teresa Teresa at skilledhealth.com.au. We also have a website, skilledhealth.com.au. So you can definitely reach me through that as well. Um, my Facebook. So if you're watching this on the Facebook platform, you probably already have, you know, through Joe, figured out where you can find me. So there's some of the platforms that you can find me on. And I noticed Fantastic. that Ken, and I, Ken I'm... write something there about <laughs> pretty <woman. laughs> Put the details for the symp symposium below so people can join that wait list and um, we can get on with creating the awesome content and all of the things that we're going to be sharing and giving away during the symposium. So thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you for chatting with me. Thank you for helping me manage all of the internet things. And I'm really looking forward to chatting with Tasha Casper tomorrow. So look out for that coming to your Facebook feed near you. Have a great day, everybody.